Hi, I'm Rayma. And I'm Andrea. And this is Mile High Murder. We are just slightly obsessed with true crime. We text each other when new missing persons cases are unfolding. We add each other to Facebook sleuth groups and definitely feel like we have solved the cases before anyone else. We aren't creepy, I promise. That's fine. That was dumb. It's fine. I'm just going to laugh. I'm ready. Sorry. <laughs> so I have a case for you today that happened in October 2012. And something that's interesting about this case is that it happened at the same time as Jessica Ridgway went missing. Do you remember her? Oh, gosh, yes. I don't think anyone that... That was really awful. It's awful. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. I don't think anyone that even lived in this area would not know that name. But I think it was a national story, too. So Mm -hmm. um, she went missing on October 5th, 2012. And this case happened, like, exactly the same time. And because of that, this case didn't have as much uh, media attention because... Everyone was all on that case. So this one's a little bit harder to dig into. But. Was it in the same area? Yep. It was in the same area. Okay. So in October 2012, Ari Liggett was 24 years old and lived with his mom, Beverly Liggett. Ari had been seen a psychiatrist from the time that he was young. Ari's dad, Ron Liggett, even told the Denver Post that by age five, Ari Liggett was showing signs of mental illness. Oh, how sad. Yeah. He was quoted as saying... He would never explore the outer world. He would only cling to his mother or me, literally cling to our clothes. He said that was his life. No interaction with children whatsoever. No play. No pretend play. Oh, that would break my heart. I know. We le- we talk about it all the time. Like we love, well, somebody will step in the shower and see like a dinosaur or something. Oh, you yeah. Know, like those little little things that just remind you, you have little, I know. little kids in the house. I love my daughter's imagination. It's, yeah. And but I Legos. Yeah, Totally. All yeah, the just, oh, that's so sad. Yeah. I uh, I think, too, obviously, they knew, like, something's not right here. Sure. And so I'm sure that's why he was seen a psychiatrist at such a young age. So he also noted that early on, Ari showed no signs of violent behavior. As he grew, however, his personal isolation would manifest itself in different ways. His dad said he paced incessantly and talked to himself incessantly, which is just a little scary. I think I wouldn't know how to handle that if my kid did that all the time. That's sad. Over the years, doctors diagnosed Ari with several conditions ranging from mild autism to schizophrenia. He had been placed in involuntary holds at least six times. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine doing that with your child? No, I can't. I don't want to either. No. No one, especially Beverly, could have suspected that Ari was what Ari was capable of. Warning signs started popping up in 2010 when he was 22. Ari was arrested for illegal weapons possession because he had manuf- manufactured a silencer. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. As police questioned Ari, he told them he had a suitcase at the Boulder homeless shelter that contained substances that, <gasps> quote, could potentially be dangerous if someone didn't know what they were or how to handle them. Oh, my gosh. How have I never heard of this? I know. It's because it happened the exact same time. So it just wow. was not. I feel like a lot of people haven't heard of this one. And it is a very interesting case. So this led them to closing the homeless shelter for seven hours and a bomb squad and a hazmat team went in to remove the item. It was a mason jar type container filled with a granular substance. Oh, wow. So Sarah Huntley, a spokeswoman for the Boulder Police Department, said field tests on the substance were inconclusive, but authorities suspect it was potassium ferrocyanide. Potassium ferrocyanide is a dangerous, is dangerous, sorry, is not dangerous as a powder form, but can become dangerous mixed with other substances and in a different form, so like liquid form. And Ari was held on a $100,000 bail after that case. And I don't have the exact information on it, but it sounds like he was um, put on, just sent to psychi- psychiatrist for mental health stuff after this whole thing happened. So okay, gotcha. that kind of was what they ended up sentencing him to, and I don't know the sentencing exactly. So just two years later, Ari was living with his mom in Centennial, His mom, Beverly Liggett, had recently graduated from nursing school and was entering her career. She was engaged to her boyfriend, but she had the mental health of her son, Wayne, heavy on her. Uh, Ari's mental health was declining and she was concerned for him. He, she didn't want him to live in like a mental health hospital. She wanted to take him in. That's amazing. Yeah. And she, she feared for a lot of things actually, but she, um, 
she loved him enough that she didn't want to see him there, and she right. had a lot of hope for him. She confided in her ex-husband that she was worried that Ari had stopped taking his medication. So she actually tried calling Ari's psychiatrist. She just wanted to know, like, she wanted to be able to ask what medication he was on, if if he was still taking it. And by law, the psychiatrist actually couldn't call, couldn't even call her back. Even if he's, wow, that's kind of great. I mean, she has he was over 18. Kind of, right. Yeah. But it, you would think that she would have some kind of like power of attorney or, or, you know, something like that. Right. But I think he, he wasn't to the point where he didn't have his own like right over his money and all those sure. things. So she didn't have, have, she didn't have that power. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so she actually decided to remove Ari from her will because of a few things that had happened that caused her to be worried that he was off his medication. On October 15th, Livia Liggett, Beverly's daughter, and Ron heard had not heard from Beverly, so they reached out to her fiancé, Seth, who said that he had only heard from her over email and text message, but that he felt that the replies had actually come from Ari and not Beverly. Oh, no. Which, I don't know how how many days this had been that he'd got these replies, but... Uh, Ron tried to call Beverly, but Ari answered pretending to be Beverly, which of course he knew right away. Yeah. It wasn't her. The voice would sound so different. Yeah. So together, Ron and Seth made a missing persons report. The police went to Beverly's house and found her car. Her car was missing, sorry, but her person keys were still inside the home. While searching the home, they found traces of blood in the freezer and the bathtub and a large kitchen knife. Oh my gosh, the freezer. Yeah. No. And then they found a large kitchen knife and a handsaw were found in the top rack of the dishwasher. Oh, that's terrifying. Okay, it gets worse. Stuck inside the handsaw were traces of what appeared to be ligament. Ooh. So they traced Beverly's bank transactions and found out that her card was being used in the Western Slope. On the 17th, a deputy who was posted on scene at Beverly's home saw a car that matched the description of Beverly's vehicle and put out a call over police radio. A Greenwood Village police officer pulled over the vehicle, but as he approached the vehicle, Ari, who was driving it, sped off and ended up crashing into a concrete wall and then attempted to flee on foot. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so just like, got scared and tried to run. He was arrested, and during his arrest, a police car dash cam recorded Ari making some weird comments. So some of these comments that he made are, quote, I can't tell right from wrong. I'm insane. My psychiatrist will confirm that. And, quote, if I can convince you guys that there is no probable cause that I am legally sane, do you press criminal charges? Oh, come on. That sounds like you're trying to set that whole thing up like, for insanity. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they thought, too. And then another quote was, I think breaking most laws is the right thing to do because most people are demons. I think what everyone can read my mind, tell the future, and shape change. So oh my it, gosh, that's terrifying. Yeah, they just definitely, I mean, he was just saying these things that were obviously trying to set him up to try and get out of right. whatever happened. So as they searched the vehicle, they find two padlocked plastic storage bins that were filled with what they said was olive oil and Beverly's dismembered body. Oh gosh. Yeah. So maybe if while he was driving, he was like taking her body to dispose of her? Yes. So... Um, I'll get into that. Okay. Court documents revealed that Ari claims he found his mom dead on the living room floor and believed she had committed suicide by ingesting ingesting potassium cyanide. He claims he panicked and tried to put her body in the freezer before deciding to try and hide her body in tubs with vinegar and store them in a storage unit in hopes that police would not be able to identify the body. So his plan was he was taking them to a storage unit. Gotcha. Okay. Why the vinegar? I like, actually have no idea. Or to... Some decompose. He said vinegar. Uh, some reports said olive oil. So I actually don't even know what exactly it was. Okay, but I don't. I don't know. I don't I've know. Never I heard don't, anyone maybe to that. destroy somehow. But vinegar. Because why I would, would he want would to destroy. preserve? Yeah. Huh. He would want to preserve it. No. I'm sure. So after arriving in the area where he wanted to rent the storage unit, he realized he didn't have enough money. So he went back to the house in plans of selling his PlayStation for more cash. So he drove all the way to the Western Slope. To get a storage unit, because obviously he was trying to take it somewhere far away from sure. him, too, and realized he didn't have enough cash, which is just, he was young and just not there, you know, like, yeah. just not thinking through all these things, or really thinking, I'll get away with it, because I'll in- plea insanity, Maybe, yeah. you know? 
So the search of the home also turned up potassium cyanide, which according to the Denver Post, is a poisonous compound that can cause people who consume it to lose consciousness, vomit, and die. They also found vomit in the living room. Oh, gosh. While being questioned, Liggett revealed that his mom had removed him from her will, and he said, quote, you know, my psychiatrist and um, therapist um, can prove that I have completely in- inculpable state of mind also and have had it for months. So, I mean, when you say stuff like that, you sound sane. You sound like you are culpable. Right. Because you're, you're sane enough to say, I'm insane doing this. I don't know. Right. No, yeah. no, no, no. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, so in this, after he said that, the investigator said, what does that mean to you for him to be in unculpable state of mind? And he said, it means I'm not criminally liable. So he felt he like. He knows that. Yeah, exactly. So then you're, you are in your I can right get away mind. with it. Right. Yeah. Maybe, at the, I mean, maybe he could plead it at the time of the, of the murder. He was insane. I don't know how you prove that though. Yeah. So they obviously had to do a court hearing about like, if he was sane enough to strand ta- stand trial. Sure. And they obviously said yes, because of these statements, they yeah. felt like he was sane enough to be Absolutely. able to stand trial. Absolutely. So, yeah. In July 2014, Liggett had pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but a state mental hospital found him competent to stand trial. A jury convicted Liggett of first-degree murder after deliberation on November 10th, 2014. The court sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And he's currently serving a life sentence at San Carlos Correctional Facility. So first-degree murder means there was evidence that he planned it. Um, One of the things that they feel like he planned it is actually obtaining the potassium cyanide to be able to do it so apparently he he just had like ordered it or whatever and months in advance and so and even when he had potassium ferrocyanide was a little that went into them saying like he's planned this he that was years before this happened Mm -hmm. and so they just knew maybe i don't know that they for sure knew he wanted to kill his mom but they knew he planned to do something with that well and you said that she had just written him out of the will so Mm -hmm. there's motive Right, absolutely. And mm-hmm. he knew it. He even said it. He told them that. So he oh, told them the wow. motive. Yeah. And then, like I said, so it happened at the same time that the Jessica Ridgway case happened. And they actually thought that the police actually thought um, had him as a suspect for the Jessica Ridgway case because Whoa, I'd never heard that. Yeah, because they found his mother's, you know, body parts like not you know sure. and that jessica ridgeway was also found dismembered and so oh, because right. it was so at the same time and they just thought maybe same area yeah and so they uh they got collected his dna and ran it and it didn't match so right they, and if you they did find who killed jessica ridgeway if you don't know about the case you can look it up because i'm sorry we're not gonna we're never cover gonna that, that one, one. I, it's heartbreaking we can't. it's too hard but if you're interested you can look it up and they did find who killed her. And yeah. So yeah. So that's the end of the Ari Liggett case. Thanks for joining us every Wednesday for a new case, guys. If you are a fan of Mile High Murder, consider subscribing and writing a review and sharing with your friends. You can also follow us on Instagram at Mile High Murder Podcast or search for our discussion group on Facebook. We're always searching for Colorado cases to cover. If you have a case you're dying for us to share, send us an email at milehighmurderpodcast at gmail.com.